Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon voted for Miller's Cornfield during the Battle of Antietam to be animated. If you would like to vote in the next poll, cruise on over to the Patreon page and cast your ballot. The link is in the description below. After the bloody but major victory for the Confederacy at the Second Bull Run, Robert E. Lee went forward with his first invasion of the North. It was not an easy advance. The rebels faced resistance at Harper's Ferry and South Mountain. Lee's men had basically fought for over three weeks straight. His regiments were thinning because of the constant fighting, and these casualties would be felt on the next battlefield. The two armies met along Antietam Creek, outside the town of Sharpsburg, Maryland. On the night of September 16, 1862, a small engagement northeast of town between John Bell Hood's rebels and Brigadier General Truman Seymour's Brigade of Pennsylvania Reserves set the battle lines for the next day's fight. Around 5.15 a.m. on September 17th, the Confederate advance line on the left flank was held by Douglas's brigade of Georgians in the field south of Miller's Cornfield. James Walker's brigade to their right, and the Stonewall Brigade and Penn's brigade formed to their left. Seymour's men had stayed on the field the whole night, waiting to re-engage with the enemy at dawn. The Pennsylvanians pushed back the 31st Georgia, but the 13th and 5th Pennsylvania Reserves could not hold out against two enemy brigades. The 13th, running low on ammunition and not having eaten since noon the previous day, pulled back and the 1st and 2nd Pennsylvania Reserves took their place, and to the right, one of Abner Doubleday's brigades full of New Yorkers moved through Miller's Cornfield to engage with the Georgians. Right behind the New Yorkers was the Iron Brigade, and they moved to the New Yorkers' right. At first, Duray's men took position along the fence line, but the 105th and 104th New York moved into the field to attack the Georgians. Both sides threw volley after volley into each other until Walker moved the 21st Georgia and the 21st North Carolina to the Union flank, catching the New Yorkers off guard and sending them back to the fence line. Brigadier General John Gibbon's right flank was threatened by the Stonewall Brigade and Penn's Brigade, so he sent the 19th Indiana and 7th Wisconsin to the west in an attempt to outflank the Confederates. Douglas asked for reinforcements. His division commander, Alexander Lawton, ordered Hayes' small Louisiana Brigade to Douglas's right. As the Confederates were reinforcing their line, Duray saw what he believed to be rebel troops on his flank in the woods to the east of the cornfield. What he saw was most likely some of Seymour's brigade falling back. Nevertheless, Duray pulled his entire brigade back to avoid being flanked. The Confederates, seeing the blue troops evacuate their position, ordered an advance, but before they could reach the cornfield, Hartsuff's brigade took the place of the New Yorkers and delivered devastating volleys into the Louisianians and Georgians, which forced them back. The 6th and 2nd Wisconsin of the Iron Brigade advanced on the Georgians. Gibbon sent three companies from the 6th west of the Hagerstown Pike to occupy the Stonewall Brigade and Penn's Brigade on their right flank. Early in the fighting, Brigadier General John R. Jones, the commander of the Stonewall Division, had an enemy shell explode over his head and disorient him. While he recovered, Brigadier General William E. Stark took command of the division. Stark could see Douglas's Georgians beginning to fall back due to the pressure placed on them by Hartsuff and Gibbon. He wanted to keep the Confederate extreme left secure and encouraged the Stonewall Brigade and Penn's men to hold their position. But the two brigades barely had 500 men combined. Penn himself was merely a captain leading a brigade. Grigsby leading the Stonewall Brigade was a colonel. Artillery fire and musketry was thinning their ranks. The rebels had no choice. They had to fall back to safety. Stark, in an effort to save the Confederate line, sent his last two brigades, his own brigade of Louisianians under Jesse Williams and Tolliver's brigade, now under James Jackson, to the Hagerstown Pike. The 6th and 2nd Wisconsin, along with the 84th New York and the 2nd United States Sharpshooters, wheeled to meet the Confederate threat. Additionally, the rest of the Iron Brigade, backed up by parts of Patrick's brigade, attacked them from behind, which sent the rest of Stark's men into a retreat. Among the fallen was Stark himself placing Colonel Grigsby of the Stonewall Brigade in command of the entire division. The situation was dire for the rebels. Word got to General Hood that his troops were needed. His veterans began filing in around the Dunker Church around 7 a.m. A member of the 1st Texas remembered, standing inactive, conscious of unseen danger with bullets whistling over and around them, the increasing rattle of musketry in front, and now and then the ominous shriek of a shell as it tears through the ranks. The strain upon the men is terrible. Hood's regiments became squished in the confines of the fenced-in clover field, but they nevertheless pushed forward and drove the Yankees back. Hood himself micromanaged the situation, sending the 4th Texas as support for the regiments attacking the cornfield 
and the 5th Texas to extend the line on the right. Collectively, Hood's division rolled up most of the brigades in their front. Numerous blue troops commented on the ferociousness of the attack and the intimidating sound of the rebel yell. Law's men, when they got to the north end of the cornfield, found two brigades under Brigadier General George Meade. To the west, part of Gibbons and Patrick's brigades were still in the west woods and came out to attack Hood's left flank. Both sides delivered devastating volleys into one another. The 1st Texas held their own against the entire brigade of Federals in the cornfield, taking a horrible amount of casualties. Law's men pushed back a couple of Union regiments. To the west, Hood's men were taking punishment from the Iron Brigade and finally broke ranks. With their left flank crumbling, the 1st Texas and Law's brigade were forced to retreat. The Confederate division had saved the rebel line, but they could not defend their position against the overwhelming numbers pushing against their battle lines. Major General Daniel Harvey Hill's division was just to the south, and getting word about the desperateness of the situation, he rushed three of his brigades north. The first to reach the field was Brigadier General Ripley's troops, who were able to push back the Union onslaught and take up a position on the southern fence row of the cornfield. Ripley himself was wounded in the throat in the advance, and he would hand over command to George Doles. The Confederate line was well anchored at the moment, but to the north, Major General Mansfield's 12th Corps began to arrive to aid the 1st Corps in destroying the Confederate flank. Mansfield's Corps, which was made up of a combination of new recruits and veterans, had difficulty coming into battle lines under fire as the Green troops moved from side to side to avoid the artillery shells being thrown their way. Mansfield himself helped form the battle lines to the east of the cornfield. While he was near the 10th Main, a bullet struck him in the chest and he would die the next day. The 128th Pennsylvania, being one of the largest regiments on the field, advanced against Ripley's men, but their presence out in front of the Federal line drew heavy fire from the entire Rebel Brigade. The Pennsylvanians moved out of the firing range by moving east towards the woods and the 10th Main. It was about 8 a.m. when the next brigade of D.H. Hill's division, under Colonel Alfred Colquitt, advanced through Ripley's line and pushed back more Federals from the cornfield. McRae's brigade from D.H. Hill's division was the last of the reinforcements that Hill could provide. Like many of the units at Antietam, McRae's men had fought hard engagements for around three weeks at this point. Most of their experienced officers were wounded or killed at Fox's Gap days earlier. Because of this, new officers confused the men with contradictory orders, and when they moved into the East Woods, one officer claimed to see blue troops on their flank, and panic spread throughout the ranks, sending McRae's 750 North Carolinians headed for the rear. Ripley's men and the conglomeration of troops on the Confederate right were running out of ammunition and exhausted. More of Mansfield's division arrived in the form of Tyndale and Stain Rook's brigades. This buildup of Federal forces forced Hill's brigades to fall back. Tyndale and Stain Rook's men pushed on towards the Dunker Church, threatening to capture the high ground around the building. Reinforcements soon hit the field for both sides. Major General John Sedgwick's division deployed into battle lines. Hood's disorganized division attempted to fight back, but could not stand against the approaching Federals. For the Confederates, Major General Lafayette McClaws's men emerged on the scene. Lee's men had fought all morning to keep the area around the cornfield. Some regiments had lost nearly 50% of their fighting force. Now, the two sides became locked in a bitter struggle in the woods around the church. The Confederates were holding on for dear life to keep the entire army from being flanked. The sudden rush of troops in that sector were able to hold off the Union division. It was 10 a.m. and the fighting had come to a halt. The men in Hooker's 1st Corps, Mansfield's 12th Corps, and the rebels in Hood, Stark, Hill, and Lawton's divisions had fought for five exhausting hours. Lee had barely avoided disaster, but more Union divisions were pressing on the Confederate center around a sunken farm road that would take on immortal status as the Bloody Lane. Thank you all so much for watching. Please consider subscribing if you have not done so already. Also, check out the Patreon page if you'd like to vote for the next animation. Thank you all again, and have a great day. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. As history will travel, reads the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland To educate the world is his mission A professor of fortune is a man called Historian
historians.